You're live. Okay. I said Ciano. <laughs> Psalm 46 and Psalm 23. that we are actually meeting together. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Tuesday morning, uh, excuse me, Tuesday afternoon, 1 o'clock, Women's Fellowship in BNC. Uh, Marilyn Chadwick is speaking. Uh, so again, 1 o'clock, BNC, Women's Fellowship, back there. Wednesday morning, La Peep, 8.30, Marty Granger uh, leads that uh, group over at La Peep for the guys at 8.30. Thursdays in uh, C, we are meeting from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock with uh, Floyd Elmore uh, teaching that. It was, a, it was a good turnout. I was kind of wondering how switching from 6.30 to 4 o'clock would, would, uh, would work, but it's actually working out very, very well. 
We had a uh, we had a good group there. Uh, there was some, oh, grief share. Uh, where's Joy Nelson? Wendell Nelson. Yeah, Joy Nelson grief share starts up February second again in uh, Jasmine. Jasmine. Okay, in the Jasmine room. And the, yeah, you have uh, uh, brochures, flyers on the table for uh, for uh, grief share. That's there. Anything else going on? Welcome back to David. He's feeling better. Floyd is. Floyd, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Floyd, is, Floyd is feeling better. Floyd, you here? And Floyd is feeling better. Oh, which is good, so you're not having to listen to me. Which is always a blessing. No, stop. No, it's like, you know, you, you know you're gifted, you know you're lame. It's like, as much as possible, I try to stay in my lane. But you are a very, but you are a very kind, generous patient group and I surely appreciate that. Music today is uh, Psalm 46 and Psalm 23. We're opening with Psalm 46. Uh, with the music that it's open in prayer. Again, thank you. Any, oh, excuse me. Anybody new for the very first time? Welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you for being here. This is uh, it's a good group. It's a very, like, a very kind group. It's a very um, casual group. And uh, it's, it's usually one of those things on Sunday mornings as we started this 10 years ago now. And it was, um, uh, for those of you who've been around for a long time, you know how, how this got going. But God had kind of put it on my heart to uh, uh, have something on Sunday mornings on campus. And I told God, good luck with that. I hope you find somebody to, <laughs> I hope you find somebody to put that together. <laughs> you know, so... We start, first two years we were meeting, we were meeting over in uh, one of the rooms over there, and then uh, David became available on Sundays, and we is this on? Is that working back yes. there? Yeah. Then, then, uh, that, uh, then that David came on board, and we uh, we started over here. But this has been this has been a good group. It's one of those that God put together, and uh, my my prayer has always been, you know, just don't be the engineer for the train wreck. You know, this is this has been a great group for many many years. Again, it's very kind. You know, we don't have to travel very far, um, but we certainly do understand, you know, the folks that are looking for a large choir. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, Cheryl, Cheryl's always had. Cheryl's always been. You know, if, if if you don't have a choir and you don't have programs, then it's not real. Well, we've got YouTube, and and, and, and we may be having some live singing shortly. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how that um, how that goes. But anyway, thank you for being here. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for this gathering together of your people. We uh, we are always encouraged by that as um, we assemble together in your name uh, for your glory. We ask that your Spirit would be with us. Give us joy. Give us peace. Uh, give us encouragement for those who need encouragement. Uh, may we seek out, seek them out and give that to them. Uh, the, the hope that uh, only you can give. We ask that you bless us today in your name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 46. John, if you get the lights. Oh, you already got the lights. Okay. Okay.
Welcome back. We are good. All right, I'm going to try this. Can you hear me in the back? Yes? No. I'm seeing this. No. You say no, but you're saying yes. No. All right, we do this dance every week. Let's see if we can get this up. That was better? Yeah. Oh, I have to swallow yeah. my color. That should be better. Have my ears. Have my ears. All right, now I'm going to trip over this, so let's put that behind me. There we go. All right. All right. So it's been a long time. I apologize for last week after I made it through the, uh, the wedding. Christmas, not having any power, and spending Christmas in a hotel because of that. I entered January and proceeded to get sick, down for like a week. So one of those things when all the world is spinning, or I was spinning, one of the two. But I apologize and I appreciate your patience, but I'm totally good. So it's nice to see you. I want to open a prayer and then. We haven't seen each other for like five weeks, so four weeks. So I'm going to catch you up to speed. I don't expect at all that you remember what book we're studying. <laughs> so that's okay. I will uh, summarize. <clears throat> but there was a wedding. So it went, went off with just one hitch. Woohoo! <laughs> 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 oh, it was the right hitch. Oh, oh. The highlight of the wedding for me was you know, Amanda was a one of the bridesmaids, and so she walks down the aisle with a service dog, Genius, 85 pound bundle of joy. And uh, Karianas, you know, maid of honor, spreads her dress out when they're up there to do the ceremony. The dog sees a nice white blanket and decides to do something. He laid right on it. Oh, no. He was a little bit annoyed when they made her move. <laughs> but it was good. There was a lot of. Um, a lot of love there, and uh, I'm so glad it's over. <laughs> so Dave and Kayana are now living in Pennsylvania. They have found a basement of a house in which they're living for the next six months, I think. Kayana's in school. Dave is looking for a job, and I uh, appreciate you first. Well, that's good. And Christmas came along, and it was cold. How did you make it for Christmas? We woke up on Christmas Eve and had no water, and then it was frozen. We have a well, so apparently the well head froze. You know all those fake rocks you see on some of the lawns? That's a well under there. And so when I looked under there, like, I come from New England, right? So we put our well heads below the frost line. This is right on the ground, so I wonder if it froze. So we spent Christmas uh, in a hotel, which was Rock Hill. So that was a memorable Christmas. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm very happy to be back. So let me. Uh, Open up in prayer. Happy New Year. Our Father, as we come now and open your word, we just again pray for this entire year that you would bless us, that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. And we pray that as we open your word, that we would grow closer to you. And in this encounter, that we would not be left unchanged, but that our hearts would draw closer to you. So we pray for this time and ask that you give us wisdom and understanding. We thank you for your grace and your mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. So after this long break, we are going back to the book of Colossians, written by the Apostle Paul to the church of Colossae, which is modern-day Turkey, and they've got two problems. One has to do with the philosophy, and it still is the Roman world, but Greek philosophy dominates the day. So it's some sort of philosophical challenge to the gospel. The other is some sort of continual challenge with the law. So if you want to summarize the whole book of Colossians in modern terms, I would say the, the book of Colossians is trying to answer the question, do you have the real Jesus or a fake one? And I think that is as relevant today 
as it was back then. There's always a challenge. The best lie is just a little bit shy of the truth. So if you don't do your homework, you don't tell your teacher that the aliens came down and ate it. You say your mother has it in her car at work. The best lie is just a little bit shy of the truth. Um, and so the devil works on that same kind of principle. So it's very difficult to say that, okay, the Son of God didn't come and he didn't offer salvation freely from the world. So what you do is you just sort of edge off a little bit as to who he is. And that happens even today. And I get in trouble sometimes when I say that the real Jesus is not the social justice Jesus. And the reason why that that's a little bit shy of the truth is that social justice will follow the gospel. It always follows the cross. But it doesn't lead the cross. Christianity is not about making the world a better city. It's not about making the world a better place. It's about being reconciled to God because we rebelled against him. And all of the cries for justice need to come. So the no justice, no peace really should say no Jesus, no justice, no peace. It's just a little bit shy of the truth. It's not that social justice is bad, it's just that's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about being reconciled to God and following the king of another kingdom. We also have the, the help me out Jesus, or the rabbit's foot Jesus, who is, he's there to make my life a better life. Along with that is the doctor Jesus, who is there to heal me of every ailment. Now, best lies with the child truth. He does heal, he does answer prayer, and then sometimes he miraculous. Sometimes he'll reverse cancer. Sometimes he won't. Sometimes he will heal over a period of time. Sometimes he won't. Sometimes he heals instantaneously. But he always heals in eternity. So the healing follows the cross. And if we don't recognize that, then we miss this most important principle of Christianity, which is his power is made perfect in weakness. That's the potting soil for faith. If we don't have something, if we don't have pain, if we don't have sorrow, it's very hard to grow in faith. The analogy I've always used is you can't go to the gym and lift 10 pounds of weight and expect to you know, be all beefed up like Thor. It's got to burn, it's got to hurt, the weight has to increase, and that's the point of suffering. His power is made perfect in weakness. But if our view of Jesus is he's there at my beck and call to heal me every time I cry out, then what happens when we get disillusioned? Because we forget that his power is made perfect in weakness, and that true healing comes in eternity. That's a big deal because there's a lot of emotions and pain and sorrow that is attached to it in this world, and the only way to get through that is by faith in the real Jesus, understanding that he hasn't ignored us, that he truly loves us, he wants what's best, but he knows what's best, and this suffering time is for a short period. So we wind up praying, God, get me out of this, instead of God, help me through this, to your name's sake. I would rather pray, God, get me out of this. I think most of us, being honest, would say that. God, get me through this, is to say, however this happens, let me glorify you, because I just don't know how I'm going to deal with this. And that will then go on to, well, he's not really hearing me, he's not really answering my prayers, so in Colossians 1, he said that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's before all things. He created all things. And that he holds all things together. So I say to people, do you really want to know if God's answering your prayers? Open your eyes and wiggle your fingers. If the fingers remain attached, he's hearing your prayers. Because in him, all things hold together. Literally. So he's hearing you. But the real Jesus is 100% God, 100% man has our best interests in hearts, has reconciled us to God, and who has asked us to live this time by faith, which often comes with the suffering of problems. So somebody has come into the Colossian church and said, no, there's a better way, a better plan, you got the wrong Jesus. Well, Paul never really calls them out on the carpet in detail. Instead, what he does, he just gives them a picture of what the real Jesus is like. That's Colossians 1, verse 15 and following, the image of the invisible God. The first one over all creation. Everything's created by him, for him, through him. He is the end of all, and he's reconciled us to God. That's the real Jesus. So this is what Colossians is about. And when you become a Christian, it's not adopting a religion. I know that's what the world says. 
said Christianity is one of the major religions of the world. Well, yeah, by that definition it is. But Christianity is not about adopting a religion. It's not about joining a church. It's not about signing under a doctrinal statement. Christianity is about following the king. And he's the king of a kingdom of which we are its citizens here a little too soon, but right on time. Because his kingdom is not inaugurated until he comes back. And to get from here to there requires faith that we got the right Jesus. In a sense, it's a hard way to live. That's a way of living, and it's like, this world is not all that matters. It's the next. There's something greater than this world. There's something greater than this life. And if you think about it, that's programmed into people that believe and who don't believe. There's no other reason to understand why people in the military, for example, would lay down their lives for their country or lay down their lives for their um, people that they're fighting along their brothers that they're fighting alongside with. They wouldn't do that if they didn't understand that there is something greater. It's higher, it's, it's within us. And that's what it is for Christians, to be follow the king of another kingdom at any cost. Because we are not afraid of those that can the body, those that can kill the body and the soul in hell. So the real Jesus is one who is completely God. So, once I know who the real Jesus is, what do I do about it? And that's where Colossians goes. Paul always does that. He always crosses the line from preaching to meddling. And it happens about half of the book. And that's what he's doing now. He's going into the, okay, so what do I do about it? How should we then live? The answer to it is going to be, well, because we're people of another kingdom, we need to understand that we are, number one, out of place. This is not our kingdom. Jesus said that to Pilate. This is not his kingdom where his followers would fight. We are citizens of a kingdom that is yet to come. So we're here at a place. We're also at a phase. By that, I don't mean Star Trek, like here's your phaser. I mean that we act differently from the rest of the world. We think differently. We act differently. And you verify that every time you shake your head and your hands at what you're seeing happening in the country or watching TV. And you're saying, I don't understand why people can't get it. That's because the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So they cannot see the light of the gospel. Spiritual blindness is pernicious because number one is you don't know that you're blind. You don't know that you're spiritually blind. So if you're physically blind, you bump into things. You're spiritually blind, you don't. But the worst part about spiritual blindness is you think you see. That's the worst part. Because then you start fighting for justice or rights or the things that look good but are shy of the truth. And you fight for them because they have good names like justice and peace and love. But in reality, when you pull back the covers, it's not God's justice. We're fighting for our justice, therefore on our terms. It's not God's understanding of love where you die for the other person but it's a reciprocal love where I put my piece in, you put your piece in, and somehow we make it through. And we atone for ourselves. This is the world in which we live. But we're at a phase with that, which is the whole second half of the book of Colossians, which we're going to. It's like, okay, since you are people of another kingdom, out of place and out of faith, this is how you now are to live. But we're also out of time in the sense that we're here too soon. That's the weird part, is that in the Old Testament prophecies that the kingdom of God would come when the Holy Spirit and the Messiah are together. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. It's Isaiah 61, which Jesus himself quoted about himself. The weird thing is, is that when Jesus died and rose again, he told his disciples, I'm leaving. And then he goes and he ascends into heaven and he's his disciples are left standing there gawking, looking up in heaven, and the smart aleck, the angels, they do have smart aleck, the angels. So what are you looking at? <laughs> Most of the angels from New York are smart aleck, the angels. <laughs> Forget about it. I would, if I had been a smart aleck, the apostle, I would have said, what, are you kidding me? Forget about it. I mean, every day you see somebody rise into the sky. What do you think I'm looking at? Now that's so, out of time, is that he left. And then, 
Acts 2, his spirit comes. Time out. What good is the coming of the Holy Spirit if the king's not here? But that's what we found out is the mystery of the church. New Testament church was born in Acts chapter 2. Indwelled by the Spirit, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the people of Jesus to proclaim the good news, to tell people this has all been a lie. And the truth is God really does love you. There is a solution to this. And that Jesus died so that we might live. But there will come a day when Jesus comes back. Now we've got Messiah and Spirit, and the kingdom is inaugurated. So we have a, live as a people who are really out of place, out of phase, out of time. Here a little early, but just on time for a kingdom that is not yet fully come. You with me? Mm -hmm. All right. All of which is to say, as we're coming into the second half of the book, how should we then live? I'll give you the caution that I give to most people. And it's going to sit for me. And that caution is this. Christianity is not first and foremost about character change. Ooh. Well, because God loves to forgive and I love to sin, it's actually a good deal. <laughs> Shall we go on continuing to sin that grace might increase? Might never be. So character change is important. It's just not about character change. Now, we instinctively know that in January when you go on your yearly diet. <laughs> <laughs> Because you realize that, you know, I can only eat lettuce for so long. And somewhere around, I would say, Valentine's Day, the temptation of Satan, the chocolate comes out. <laughs> Never mind. And we realize that we struggle with the same things over and over and over again, but that we can do all things in Christ, that he does set us free, but we're still wrestling with these same issues. Character change follows the cross. You can't walk with Jesus and be unchanged. It's not a do you walk. But it's not about character change, or we'll all fall short. That's the, the lie of the law. And those in Colossae that were looking to the law were thinking, if I just check all these boxes, then I will be a good Christian. No, you can't check enough boxes to do that. Everything is by God's grace, sovereign grace, by faith, which, by the way, he gives to us, and then we obey. So the character change follows who we are. So what we do follows who we are. So you can't say, if I just do all the right things, then I'm a good Christian. That never works. It is, I am a good Christian, so I will do these things. Be holy as I am holy, is what Peter will remind us that God said. So in other words, what do you mean I'm a good Christian? Well, we'll see that when we get a little further. It's God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. You're already holy. You're already a good Christian. You are positionally removed from the kingdom of darkness and put into the kingdom of light. You have peace with God. You are reconciled. Relax. You're good. Except you don't always act that way. Yeah, my great-grandfather said, David America's a great country. He says, the people know that. The kingdom of God is a great kingdom, except the people who are alive right now who don't act that way. And so because we are the righteousness of Christ, we need to act that way, and that's what he's, he's going to. All right, so there's your introduction for 2023. Now I want to go to the second half of the book. I already started chapter three, and in the first part of chapter three, it says, if then you have been raised with Christ, they seek the things that are above where Christ is seated for him. And that's Paul's way of saying, look, because you are a Christian, because you have followed Jesus, act that way. You hear this in my house all the time. It comes with those two words I hate, grow up. Never mind. We used to have kids in the house, so every time I would grow up, I knew she was talking to one of the kids, but after my kids all grew up, I just thought I'd grow up, I knew I had a problem. <laughs> Since you are in Christ, grow up. Act that way. Set your mind on things that are above, not things that are like you're on the earth. If you've died, your life is hidden in Christ and God. So, what does that mean? This we covered last time. So you've got to put to death this whole list of things. Sexual immorality, purity, passion, desire, covetousness, versus idolatry. And so I boiled it all down last time we talked. There's two, there's actually three things. Number one, that first list is a form of idolatry. 
You're acting like you're on the wrong side of the war. So Jesus came, set you free, got you out of the prison of war camp, and you decided to go work for the enemy. That's idolatry. So all of those things, you look at sexual immorality, for example. Why is sexual immorality and idolatry? Because it turns the focus, instead of what God wanted, it turns it on me, is what I want. And so the sexual immorality becomes the biblical metaphor for idolatry throughout all scripture. So they're all dealing with idolatry. The second category has to deal with uh, the image of God, destroying the image of God. That's anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth, striking out against the image of God, which is like murder. That's why Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, which is, he's, the law says, thou shalt not kill, but I say if you call your brother a fool, you're already guilty of the gates of hell. Capital punishment, why? The answer is because you're striking out against the image of God, which is like raising your fists to God. And then in verse 9, do not lie to one another. So there's your categories, idolatry, murder, and lying. It goes back to John 8, verse 44, when Jesus says that the devil is a liar, So what is he saying in this long list? Don't act like the devil. You're on a new side. Now we pick it up in verse 9. So in verse 9 to 11, this is now we're going to the positive side. Don't be that way, be this way. And rather than just making Christianity group less, he starts by giving the principle. So look at verse 9. He started with do not lie to one another. But then he goes on and he uses the principle. Seeing that you have put off the old self, put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Now, one of the things I just want to bookmark is that I would say it over and over. In English, we don't separate you singular from you plural, but they do in Greek. And all of these passages are you plural. All have put on the new self. So you're a community that's different. You're a community that's out of phase. You actually have a, and it doesn't say new self, it actually says new man, but that's, English doesn't fit so much anymore. He's really talking about everybody, but by using the term man, he's talking about mankind. We've got this problem. This problem is we've rebelled against God, so we've got this sin nature, and even though we have the vestiges of the goodness of God that we can, can reflect, as his image, we were really corrupt to the core. So that's the old man, this, this corrupt nature that is bent towards sin. Now, if you've been with me a long time, sometimes I will bring somebody forward if they're really young. Uh, I will do this if you're over 15. <laughs> and I will hold your hands, you face that way, and you lean towards the floor and I hold your hands. And now the reason why I don't do this if you're over 15 <laughs> is because I might drop you. <laughs> in which case you get a hospital just to make a lawsuit but I said if you let go of my hand your nature is such that you're only going one way you're going down that's what a sinful nature is so every inclination of our heart is evil all the time and so we decide to sin we fall a new nature stands you up but a new nature no matter what you're not gonna fall down. That's a new nature. So act out of that nature, not the old one, not the old man, but the new man. You have put it off, it's done. The, um, you know, a lot happens in verbs and languages, and languages, I think, those are prepositions. And the verbal system from one language to another is not the same. And Greek has some really interesting verbal forms, which you have to use a lot of words in English, so I'll use a lot of words in English. You have put on the old self, it's, it, it's a done deal, it's already in the past, it happened when you stop. I'm so disappointed in you. It doesn't say that, it says it's done, it's a done deal. The done deal is the old self is put on. Y'all, you as a community, not just you as an individual, you, the church, you are holy people. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, it would indwell us a holy people. He can't. It's the blood of Jesus that does. So because we are communally that way, we're individually that way. So it's a done deal when Jesus died 
and then created his church. It's a done deal that it's uh, when put on, good enough, you start doing that and say, well, I'm going to succeed at being good enough. This is why Christianity is not about character change. Character change is the result. If it's about character change, who judges how good your character is and if you make the grade? This was Martin Luther's problem when he became a Christian after he had been a monk. He couldn't confess enough of his sins. You start to confess your sins. Well, this is what I did. Oh, I just remembered something else. Oh, yeah, I called my brother uh, an idiot. Oh, but what was the motive behind that? Why did I do that? And was that motive wrong? And what was the motive of that motive? And why am I thinking about it now? Is that wrong? It drove him nuts until he realized that being good or being bad follows, not defines what it means to be a Christian. It also takes a lot of relief off because, frankly, if we claim to be without sin, we make them out to be life. So you're going to mess up. But he doesn't look at you and say, forget it, I'm done with you. That's a tremendous relief. The new self is already on. The new self, you're already standing. Theologians will say you stand in the righteousness of Christ. It has been imputed to you. I just say you got new clothes. Which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. So it's like Jesus. You got Jesus' clothes on. Never mind. <laughs> so this is this is a huge deal. Because we are different, we act differently. Who we are leads to what we do. Let me say that again. Who we are leads to what we do. What we do does not lead to who we are. Now, there's a really dumb Tom Cruise uh, clip out right now for his uh, what is it, Maverick uh, Top Gun, the new Top Gun thing. The bit is that Tom Cruise comes out and says, I am a fire pilot. That's not what I do. It's who I am. How do I teach that? I say it's really dumb, but he's actually right. It's like who you are results in what you do. What you do does not result in who you are. Now, I'm used to put flesh on that. That means you can try to act good all day long. You can try to please God all day long. You can do devotions every day. You can get up by the walk in the morning. You can be nice to kitties. <laughs> None of that is impressive to an all-purpose God. If you're all perfect, all powerful, you have to, you don't need that. It's like when I was raising my kids before they understood the concept of money and my birthday would come around and we'd go look for things and I'd say, oh, Dad, here's a rock for you. Oh, thank you. That's the most beautiful rock. Dad, here's a pair of scissors I found in the house. Happy birthday. <laughs> oh, thank you. That happens again when you get old, by the way. <laughs> you just don't remember. <laughs> Who you are is also what you do. What you do, kitties, rocks, resins, act good, does not determine who you are because all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We're all defective. So it requires a change of who we are to allow us a level field for what we do. That's his point. And in this, there's neither Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, and Christ is in all. And is, is all and in all. I mean, it doesn't matter what, you know, if you're Jewish, you're Gentile, if you're Unlo, not Unlo, it's a human condition. Every single human is like us. Now, the bad news is who we are is defective, and that bought us a one way ticket to hell. Eternal condemnation. That's the bad news. The good news is that's why Jesus died, is that he changes who we are, new man. And he does that because he paid for the price. That's the death of Jesus. It deals with the problem of sin. The resurrection of Jesus then gives us the added benefit of eternal life. This is great news. So he changes who we are so that everything that comes after that, what we do, can happen. All right. Let's go forward. Verse 12. Put on, then... As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Well, notice they're all heart issues. And he says, put on, not meaning or undermining what he just said, that the new man is already.
put on means because you are already a new man, a new person, a new self, therefore act that way. Put on in this sense is act consistent with your new nature. But before he goes into that, because if you attack what they do, there's always somebody that just seems to be worse. You can always compare yourself to somebody that's in a bad place. Right? So you, 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 you know, didn't walk the kid across the, you know, across the street. Right? Well, here's somebody else who's walked three kids across the street, whatever. You want to attack who they are. That's the old uh, Humphrey Bogart movie, you know, African Queen, where he looks at, uh, I always miss it to Catherine Hepburn. Remember Catherine Hepburn? <laughs> Please tell me you watch movies. Yes, yes. Thank you. And Humphrey Bogart, the marshmallow, no, Humphrey Bogart. And he gets stuck with this missionary in a condo or something, and they're in a boat trying to escape. And she's a goody good Christian, and he's a hard drinking guy, and he just can't live up to her perfection. And at one point he says to her, And you call yourself a Christian. That's the best line to use against any believer. That's a line that was authored in the gates of hell. It's a line that they trade every demonic recruit with. I made that part up. <laughs> Go out and use that line. And you call yourself a Christian. Because after a while, you start to believe, I'm no good, I'm no good, I'm no good. So this verse counters that. I want you to try to memorize it. Put it on your refrigerator. When he says put on then, and he's going to say, put on the righteousness or act out of the righteousness of Christ. But he pauses and he says, but let me remind you who you are. And he says, you're chosen, meaning you're holy and beloved. Notice me in three seconds. Chosen, holy, dearly loved or beloved. Let's deal with them one at a time because they're that important. God picked you. Now you responded by faith. He picked you. He created you. Every single one of us was formed in a mother's womb. No exception. God superintended that entire process. When the DNA comes together and multiplies and your nose shows up and your eyes shows up, but even then, your personality begins to form. I got a one-year-old grandson right now. He's one. He, he can't even talk and he's telling jokes. I kid you not, Meredith last night sent me a clip. And she's holding him and they're laughing and she says, what's my name? And he looks at her and goes, Aunt Amanda. But he doesn't say Aunt Amanda because he can't talk. He goes, Amanda. Everybody knows it's Amanda. And then he laughs. And she says, no, no, what's my name? And he looks her straight in the face and says, Dad, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes on for like two minutes. And every time he says, Dad, Dad, he laughs hysterically. She keeps going, Mama. But you transfer, you know, Ezra to Joey, and he'll look at Joey and go, Mama. <laughs> and then he laughs. So he's formed by God with a personality that even before he can talk, he's telling jokes, which actually is funny. <laughs> it's funny because it annoys the parents. So the kid is going to be really good. You are formed in the same way. You're formed with certain gifts, you're formed with a personality. It's not just your body. Your person and God has done that and he picked you he wants you he loves you he doesn't put up with you he really wants you to spend time with you wants you to know his thoughts you ready know yours and he hasn't rejected you and he hasn't rejected you because Jesus died for you he likes you he wants you he wants you to be forever with him he wants you to know that his love for you is so great he doesn't want to see you suffer. And the only suffering you experience is so you have the once in an eternity that shows you. And then because your first inclination is, boy, if you really knew me, you wouldn't really want me. No, he does really know you. And he looks at you as holy. What is holy? Holy is what he is. Holy is him without imperfection at all. So God must need some spectacles. No, he doesn't. Because a spectacle model or a spiritual floor is the one I like. 
when I actually, you know, look like no movies, right? You've been watching the movies. Right. Arthur Godfrey. <laughs> Kermit the Frog. Okay. So how can God do that? That's a mystery. But you are holy. You're transferred from unholy to holy. You're not just looking at you. He's looking at Jesus. In you. And then the last word is beloved. It is one word in Greek, but it's, I like that. In the full moment of dear beloved. You're not just loved. You can be loved and like God's putting up with you. No. Dearly loved. When you're dearly loved, then that means known to know and be known. In Star Trek terminology, you've been assimilated. <laughs> Never mind. It's a unity. It's a it's a mystery that happens between a husband and a wife. It's a a strange and mystical and wonderful unity. And it's never look like each other, too, but <laughs> which one changes? Mm. <laughs> Dearly loved by God. If you forget everything else I said today, because I talk like a fire hose, chosen, holy, dearly loved. Place at a phase at a time. We become a model of a community of what it's like to live forever with God. But we're not quite there yet. We could be here a little too soon, but not on time because Jesus hasn't come back yet. So we still got some things to work on. We still got the, the warts and selfishness. And so what happens is we annoy one another. The best church splits don't happen over key theological issues. They happen over whether or not to change the hymnal or the color of the carpet or who cleaned the kitchen. It's our mirrors to you. Okay, think about that one. Bear with one another. What's that one? Well, if somebody has a complaint against another, forgive each other. That's a choice. Because we're here for just a short period of time. But that's love. That's the love that would lead to forgiveness. That's how we act. So I want to know how I act in this. No, he's going to say, love, forgive, reconcile. Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Notice it's relations, relations to the core. Now, the motto of the United States is E Corvus Unum. From many, one. We are a nation, maybe one of the greatest experiments in the history of the world, where nations were not forced under our unity. We chose to come to the United States, except for a very notable exception. And I don't want to um, gloss over that. The slaves did not choose to come. So there is the problem, one of the greatest problems in American history. But the motto says for many one, our actions have not been met. And that's why there's tension. Because in and of ourselves, we cannot produce what only reconciliation in Christ can produce. It is only Jesus that has the answer to a divided country. It's only Jesus that has the answer to all the great social ails, the inequalities, the oppression. So we say from many one, but we couldn't do it because by and large, the old man is still in place. Now come to the church. Y'all are different. From many one under the cross, which means bear with one another, forgive one another. The justice that we would have is based in love and forgiveness. And that becomes the model for the kingdom of God. See the difference? You can say all day long, e pluribus unum, and not act that way. But if you, by your nature, have been changed, we are now one, so that we are, by God's Spirit, one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, we are made who we are as one. We can then act that way, which mandates forgiveness. You notice he's talking corporately. He's telling us as a people how to live, in a sense, in enemy territory. And then he gets to the point in verse 14, and I will get to the point, and above all, put on love, which binds everything together. 
the perfect harmony, I wish there was another way of translating that. It's the end of all things, the fulfillment of all things. It's not just things that are harmonious and without conflict. It's the way things are supposed to be. So love is the glue. Hardly has a word been more misunderstood. Again, I understand the nature of our hearts, and God forgives everything. But in the society in which we live, it's when you have a conditional view of love, there's no reason, in many cases, to try to save it. It's a really great challenge. So then people are looking at the statistics and they say, wow, millennials and the upper part of Gen Z, they're not getting divorced as quickly. Good news, right? No, it depends on how you read the data. They're not getting married. <laughs> Why are they not getting married? Because they don't want to get divorced. What's the benefit of that? Just the financial benefit. That's a heightened form of, of independence. The way our society works is, oh, let's try each other out, let's live together, so on and so forth. And sooner or later, you start to get old, and somebody wants to have a kid, and that's when you start talking about marriage. Right? So, talking about marriage, because it needs to be for the benefit of the child, and so on and so forth. It's like it's got the whole thing backwards. It's a false understanding of love. The kind of love that follows across is one that forgives, one that loves unconditionally. That the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching, admonishing one another, and all. And this is how a community acts. So if love is there and thankfulness is there, then you admonish one another, you pat each other on the back, you encourage one another, you correct one another. And then you wind up singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and you like to figure out all the difference among them, but I think you're singing with you two. But notice the thankfulness in your heart. Have the thing as a community, that's the rule by which we live. And there's no way that you can codify that. There's no way you can have a thick enough book to know how to handle everything in every situation. But if you filter it through the love of Christ, sooner or later it's all clarity. And so we are walking the stage.